And then there's this panoramic review of the whole great controversy. And Uncle Bill doesn't budge. And you say to God, you were right. You knew Uncle Bill would not respond. So more time for Uncle Bill would do no good. And so when we're all completely satisfied with God's diagnosis, that everyone who is out there is out there because God could do nothing for them, then God could say, children, you know what's coming next, don't you? You know what's going to happen when I unveil my life-giving glory. And you know it's not destructive. You've been living in it for a thousand years. But you know what will happen to those people who are out of harmony out there. Are you ready for it? Because if I terrify you by what I'm about to do, some of you may serve me from fear and become my enemies. And we say, God, you can go ahead. And God unveils his life-giving glory. And the life-giving glory of God floods out all over this planet. And all that is out of harmony is consumed. And some live longer in that life-giving glory. I don't know why. I don't need to. Because I know it's not God doing it to them as torture. If God was doing it, he'd practice euthanasia and put them to sleep as quick as he could. The fact that some live longer tells me it's not God doing it. It's some natural consequence of their placing themselves out of harmony. And the only one who lives on and on is the one who used to live in the presence of God. He used to live in that life-giving glory. He walked among the stones of fire, that brilliant angel, the covering cherub. He's the one who lives on in that life-giving glory. But all I know is what God is doing as they die. You can hear him. He's crying. How can I give you up? How can I let you go? And just as David cried, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son. And God said, I like that, David. You're a man after my own heart. God will be crying, Oh, Lucifer, Lucifer, my most brilliant son. That doesn't save him. There's no way you can save Lucifer, the arch rebel who would never respond. And then when it's all over, God could turn to us and ask us, Children, did I make you afraid? Because if I did, I did it too soon. Could you say after that awesome moment, God, there's nothing else you could have done. And we're not afraid of you. Are we ready to do that? How would you like to spend the first Sabbath in the new earth next to God with him celebrating? And at the end of the day, he said, you know, I've enjoyed this Sabbath more than any other one in the history of the universe. I'd like to do it next week. Would you? He said, oh, no, one is enough. I mean, surely you've tested our obedience enough by now. You mean you're going to go on testing our obedience for the rest of eternity? Who says it's a test of obedience? It's nothing of the sort. It was given to us as a time to celebrate and remember all the things that God has revealed at such cost to demonstrate the truth about himself, that he really does want our friendship and our trust in the highest sense of freedom. And I think we'll celebrate, as Isaiah says, from one Sabbath to another for the rest of eternity. And because we'll go on keeping Sabbath, we'll never forget this costly evidence that has secured the universe against apostasy and defection for eternity. Are we legalists for keeping the seventh day? Maybe, but not all of us. Some of us keep it in the highest sense of freedom. And I wish our neighbors knew that. It's possible to be absolutely committed to doing things God's way without having the tiniest streak of legalism in you, whatever. And I wish folk can understand that. Because it, it's, a lot of good people around wish people lived better. And were more friendly. But with many of them, God doesn't help. To give them this picture of a friendly God who values nothing higher than our freedom is the final message of good news. The last message to the world is a message of a God of love, right? Not something wishy-washy. It's this kind of God we've been talking about based on all the evidence in the 66 books.